good knowledge shouldn't be hidden behind barriers or like placed into silos. Faults and flaws should be something that, you know, you have a little vulnerability and you put out into the world so everybody can improve it if motivated. I first got involved in open source with the HTML5 boilerplate project, which was is a really great way to have a bunch of sensible defaults for building a website. And I liked that it handled a lot of the corner cases and like things that you may not have thought about. I also liked that it was built by people who are experienced in the industry. So it was a lot of like best practice or like working knowledge of you know, tried and true solutions. I didn't actually participate in it. I sort of listening in for what they were talking about and what they were doing. It was kind of information overload, to be honest. So it, that kind of pushed me away for a little bit, but I think it gave a lot of really good kind of examples of like how an open source project is run and like the kinds of behaviors and like what's expected and the norms. I really like the A11Y project because of what it represents. I was drawn to it from my background in design and accessibility and what I liked, it was sort of a one-stop shop for everything you need to know. You know, one of its goals is to centralize as much of that as possible. So it puts the onus on you, the reader, to kind of figure out what you need and self-serve. But also there's a lot of opportunities for discovery that way because a lot of accessibility work is intersectional. So things you think you may not need to know wind up sneaking back up on you. And that's, that's always kind of fun when that happens. I also really like what it represents in the context of open source in that the information it presents is free to modify, is free to kind of update and upgrade by which I mean like the checklist that we have that you can use to uh, determine if your site is more on the accessible side than not, is not behind uh, a paywall. It's not a private company. It represents the, you know, the best practice knowledge that we've all collectively assembled because you shouldn't have to pay money to make your site accessible. Uh, you shouldn't have to rely on you know, a certification from a third party. These are, these are things that you should be able to learn and implement on your own and then figure out what works for you and what doesn't and then feedback into that if that's something you're interested in. Web development has education problems and I'm very reluctant to blame web developers in that the market incentivizes certain skill sets. So, you know, with code schools, pushing a lot of developers towards becoming, you know, proficient in single page application systems over kind of the underlying materials that these, these code libraries use. And, you know, this, this isn't to say that these libraries are valuable. It's just more in learning this, you oftentimes overlook other concerns, notably accessibility. So one of the goals that we're trying to do is show that it is this holistic concern that affects more than just uh, screen readers or more than just, you know, an alt attribute on an image. One thing we're trying to do is show that it's something that kind of permeates every aspect of the design experience of the development experience. And it's, it's a top level concern that a developer should be thinking about the same way a designer should be thinking about the same way a content writer should be thinking about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My mother was an occupational therapist. One thing she would get a lot growing up was she'd bring home her work with her. So she'd get these closed kind of one-off devices that the insurance company would give to her students. It really kind of stuck with me because you get this like proprietary block of crap <laughs> that like barely worked and, you know, oftentimes broke was kind of purpose built to satisfy a contract and then she'd have to kind of take it home and tinker with it to get it to actually work. Had their like circuit boards or you know their like their construction been a little bit more open that's something that you know potentially we would have been 
empowered to go back and say like, hey, we've used this in the field. Here's all these reasons why you might want to make these updates because that's something that has a direct impact on the quality of life of its recipient. The A11Y project is now my uh, full-time part-time job, as is kind of what I understand a lot of open source winds up being. I have a full-time job and I'm pretty careful to keep church and state separate. So I work on it on evenings or on the weekend. Quarantine has afforded me a lot of time <laughs> to work on it. That's, I guess, a silver lining of this whole situation. You know, I, I do try to kind of balance to make sure that it's not going to burn me out. You know, if I am going to offer one criticism of the open source movement is funding is oftentimes problematic, you know, who uses it and what they put back. Fortunately, we have received a grant, a very generous one from Envision because they are committed to supporting accessibility and inclusive design. So that does give us a little operational runway. We source contributors a number of ways and the redesign was actually one of its goals was to kind of reinvest interest an interesting thing about the web community is everything old is new again. So you'll start to see a lot of the same concepts being brought up if you've been in the gig long enough. So the information has always been out there. It's just the redesign was getting people aware that it was out there. So it's a shiny new coat of paint on a lot of good existing content. And with that interest, we definitely did see an uptick in contributors, which makes me extremely happy. You know, it was cool for a hot second on the social media. And then we found some really wonderful people who are now kind of maintainers as well. Another concern that is always top of mind for me is um, representation. And given that open source is so transparent and given that, you know, the technology field does have a lot of kind of biases and towards who is present in these spaces and how they come there. One thing I'm actively trying to pursue is you know, a diversification of our maintaining staff, notably minoritized groups, as well as disabled people, self-described, because I think it's important given the nature of the project to be as inclusive as possible. And that is one thing we're actively working towards improving. Accessibility is you know, at its core, it's interoperability, which is very friendly for software. The way that two machines can exchange information, so like a server to a browser, or like a, a markup language to multiple browsers, that interop is also conveniently the way that a lot of assistive technology consumes and presents information to people. And again, that's that's screen readers, but it's also, you know, other devices, voice control, you know, blind developers exist, you know, developers without the use of their hands exist. You know, it's something that we kind of take for granted and assume given our, you know, everyday lived experiences, but it's amazing. And especially watching them in action, if you have the opportunity to kind of, I know the W3C has some videos about, you know, assistive technology users in action. And it's just, it's really cool. And it makes me really happy that we built technology this way. So while sometimes it may not be ideal, I like that these kinds of concerns do intersect in such a way that we are able to modify and manipulate them to suit our needs. <laughs>